Part 3. Many people have noted that after taking a Big Five test, they did not feel like they learned anything new about themselves. It served only as a mirror, reflecting back what they themselves told the test, and only shallowly interpreting their input. This is understandable given what the original purpose, way, way back, for the Big Five was, to unite other theories, not to propose its own. The problem lies more with some of the proponents of the Big Five who seem to treat it like an explanation in its own right. Somewhat ironically, it fails to show people the underlying factors behind their thoughts and behavior, and instead only offers clarifications of those thoughts and behavior. For instance, facial typing, if it is successful, would have, as far as I understand it, its primary use in objectively assigning functions and types to people, but not in necessarily explaining those functions and types. The facial twitch is not the essence of TE, it's not the definition of it. It is a reliable external signal that a TE process is occurring in someone's psyche. In the same way, reliably observing a trait labeled neuroticism tells you only that neurotic symptoms are present. And that is useful, inasmuch as psychological symptoms are often very hard to pick out and pin down and examine clearly. The Big Five was, from the start, meant to be only a universal, clear taxonomy, a kind of scientific Esperanto, I guess. And in order to accomplish that, it had to avoid positing actual theories as to why the traits show up. It was an infrastructure that allowed for free exchange, kind of like YouTube is an infrastructure, but once it starts positing a theory of its own, or once YouTube starts saying that this is uh, our ideology, the moment it does that, it has to start excluding those transactions or those videos or whatever that offend those principles, and it, it, it's no longer a true infrastructure of free exchange. It is now a monopoly power. The facial micro-expression is objective. It is simply a sense experience. I saw you do it. Hypothetically, I could construct a special camera and program that could read and precisely measure where your facial muscles moved and how much, etc. But the explanation of those micro-expressions in terms of your psychic state, or rather the psychic state those expressions are, are linked to, uh, to be demonstrating, that part isn't objective, nor can it ever be. It must always remain a hypothetical description of what it is like to be you, to see objects from your point of view. This requires an interpretation, and the interpretation can only be communicated through language, unlike the empirical data which speaks for itself, ideally. And language, i.e. the concept, is inherently limited by subjectivity and requires subjective analysis, which is very different from objective analysis. Part 4. Concerning the process of factor analysis involved in reducing to the Big Five, Isenk, Isenk, uh, how do you pronounce that? Isenk argues, quote, if we regard correlations around 0.3 as justifying us in grouping together traits into super traits, what shall we make of the correlations of negative 0.49 between neuroticism and conscientiousness, or that of 0.43 between extroversion and openness, as reported by Costa, McCry, and Dye in 1991? Should we not regard lack of conscientiousness as a primary factor forming part of neuroticism and openness as a primary factor forming part of extroversion? Are openness and conscientiousness unique dimensions of personality, or are they just primaries forming part of more true major dimensions? What is the criterion for making such a decision? Unquote. Well, I don't understand the math involved, I can agree with the concept that Isenk is conveying, namely that it is far from self-evident which branches fit to which trunks in the factor analysis reduction to the big five. Isenk argues that there could just as well be a big three, and others have argued that there are even more tree trunks, a big six or a big seven. The math evidently does not provide as sheer a guide as was originally hoped. 
On this topic, the same friend of mine who took all the big five tests made the same essential point as Isenck after that experiment, uh, just without the official math, that as far as she could tell, openness and agreeableness overlapped too much with extroversion, while neuroticism and conscientiousness seemed to be inversely related to extroversion. In other words, the big five traits are not orthogonal. That is, they are not equidistant from each other as concepts. This is to be expected because they are supposed to be empirical. They're not theoretical. They were not fashioned to be points on a compass. The big five are treated as being something that was simply discovered. You know, we had no idea how many there were going to be. So it's kind of like you just found different looking rocks in a forest and they may or may not be of different kinds. Once again, we encounter Derrida here who points out that every effort of discursion, of reducing things to essentials or of demarcating categories, kind of like the rocks in the forest, will always be a subjective arbitration ultimately, and thus cannot speak for itself as something self-evident, but it has to be agreed upon by a society or enforced by that society or upon that society. Who decides that organized, for instance, is really just a secondary synonym for conscientious? Who decided, you know, which goes into the other? Probably Raymond Cattell decided that, but who gave him the right to decide that for me? Whose intuition made that important leap, ignoring certain differences between the words and emphasizing their similarities? Who decided that the differences of connotation between the words organized and conscientious are insignificant, and why did they decide that? It could not have been on the basis of some objective information, because there is none to tell us. We are not in the realm of is, but of should. We're in the realm of connotation, not denotation.